you ever wondered what's next in your life? Sometimes it's like, God, show me the next door I need to go through. That's what today's message is about, doors of opportunity. I promise you this, God's got the next thing for you, but you got to trust him for it. It takes faith. Enjoy. Doors of opportunity. Many times God opens doors and he closes doors. Through those times, people are molded, they're challenged, they're prepared. Sometimes we're even broken in that process. But one thing is for sure, and it's this, when God moves or guides, he expects us to go through the door. He expects that. If you're a parent, when you, when you raise your kids, you get them to a point that, that you want them to go from point A to point B, and you, you want them to move, you, you expect them to move when you want them to move, right? And that Sometimes that challenge in parenting happens at that moment. We want them to, you know what, God deals with that in our lives as well. He opens the door for us. He expects us to move through it. If God guides us, he expects us. If he moves us, he expects us to walk through that door that he provides. And it's in these moments that we see God work his miracles. My prayer for our church is that God's will be done. It's in a real general sense, God's will be done but that people truly seek to find the doors he has opened for their lives, for their talents, their giftings, and open it wide. I've prayed, I've prayed with people before. God, show them the door and open it wide, that they, they would know what door to walk through. And God, if this isn't your door, God, close it tightly. Close it so tight that no man can open it. Make it clear. Now, that's my prayer for our church. In these days, the, the times that we live in, Thomas Paine was one of our founding fathers of this country. And as one of those founding fathers in 1776, there's a lot of writings, things you can go back to and, and look at. And undoubtedly, we see the, the foundation of many of the ideas and principles and, and precepts that our country is built on were, were founded on biblical thinking and, and faith. And Thomas Paine, he writes in the American Cri Crisis, the description is the times that try men's souls. Thomas, he writes, tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. It's interesting, he penned that the same year that independence was declared. God had presented a door in their minds, and that door represented a freedom. A freedom of what they labeled tyranny. And they knew they needed faith to step through that. What's on the other side is always the question, isn't it? The undefined, the unknown. People will get up to the door God provides and go, well, what's on the other side? And God goes, walk through and I'll show you. Yeah, but tell me before I have to walk through. And then, and then we got a deal, Lord. And God goes, it doesn't work that way. It takes great faith to walk through the door of opportunity to freedom. Some of you will remember Robert Strand. Robert Strand... He's a writer, he's a pastor. He was the interim pastor here at Crosswalk before I came. I got to, uh, the honor of working under him uh, younger, younger times in, in my college days as his junior high pastor. He writes one particular story in one of his books called The Black Door. He says, he tells the story several generations ago during one of the most turbulent desert wars in the Middle East, a spy was captured. The general of the Persian army, a man of intelligence and compassion, had adopted an unusual custom in such cases. He permitted the prisoner to make a choice of either facing the firing squad or passing through the black door. And as the moment of the execution drew near, the general ordered the spy to be brought before him for a final interview. What shall it be, the firing squad or the black door? The general asked, and the prisoner hesitated, and finally he chose the firing squad. Not long after, a volley of shots in the courtyard announced that the grim sentence had been fulfilled. The general stared at his boots, and then he turned to his aide and said, You see how it is with men? 
They always prefer the known to the unknown, even if it means facing certain death. It is a characteristic of people to be afraid of the undefined. What lies beyond the black door? asked the aide. Freedom, replied the general, and I've known only a few men brave enough to take it. Interesting. A lot of times people step up to what we would deem a God thing, a God opportunity, a God door, and God opens it wide, but because they don't know how it will be exactly on the other side, it's undefined, it's unknown, they fall short. They turn back to what they know. We see it played time and time again in people's lives. And I want to encourage you this morning because you're going to step up to that. At some point, some way, shape, or form, God's going to open a door for each and every one of us. And it will require faith to walk through it. Faith takes me into the unknown, the undefined. I can know, I can know kind of what I'm dealing with because I know my God. And I can trust him no matter what. And walking through what God provides is his expectation for our lives. Look at Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6 says this. And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. God, show me your will. God, God, provide me the way. God opens the door, not for us to argue with him about what's on the other side, for us to walk through it. Amen? That was weak. <laughs> if I seek God with all my heart, if I trust him with all my might, and he brings me to a point that I've got to walk through something that requires faith, he will provide, for without faith, as the scripture says, it's impossible to please God. We must be willing to walk into the unknown and where the Lord leaves. We face the unknown in everyday life, every single one of us, in our spiritual walk with God. We can't possibly understand everything we're walking through. And here's what's really tough. Sometimes the things we're walking to, we're not supposed to understand. God says, walk through the door. We say, well, I want to understand. God says, no, you, you're not going to get it. I'm working on a much larger scale at a much different level. My thoughts aren't your thoughts, declares the Lord, the Bible says. Well, but God, take me into something I understand. Can I tell you that if that's your prayer and that's as far as your faith will go, God will never be able to lead you into miracle territory because miracle territory takes us out of our control. Miracle territory takes us out of the, the, the comprehension that this brain can handle, and it takes me to a point that I have to completely trust him. Some of you have walked in those, those areas. It's not, it doesn't feel good sometimes, but then God has this perfect peace that comes in, and when I walk through it, I experience something powerful, something we would even deem miraculous, because I simply trusted him no matter what. And there's no better place to be. There's no sec more secure place to be than that. We've seen the fires in Canada the past few weeks. If you've noticed, our, our sun, uh, our area has kind of been cloudy a little bit. Uh, uh, the sun has looked different the first few days. Uh, the first day of it, particularly, I was looking around. I'm like, Lord, what are you trying to say to us here? And uh, as, as you inspected and looked into to what was happening, we were experiencing the smoke drifting down. They're experiencing this far south, down, down in Missouri and even further south, the, the smoke from the forest fires. I kind of funny but wrong last night, our, our neighbors, they had those lanterns, one of the lanterns, and they're going to light the, the lantern and it, and it flies away. And they were having some trouble. Uh, getting it lit, and you would see a few of them uh, flying through the skies. And the way the wind was blowing, it was all going north. And one of the guys, <laughs> one of the neighbors, I hear him yell. He's kind of in the shadows. I can't even see who it is. And he goes, <laughs> Canada just thought they had their fires out because America's sending everything to them. It's just blowing north. <laughs> I thought it was funny, church. Come on now. Sometimes we live in a cloud, don't we? It gets a little cloudy. God, show me your way. Show me your way. And what's interesting is sometimes the closer I get to that door, <laughs> the cloudier it can sometimes get. But God, I'm wanting to obey you. I'm wanting to just come into this, this moment. I've prayed for this and I think you're showing up, but God, it's getting cloudier and it's getting cloudier. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. If he's leading you to it, he'll get you through it. 
We have to be willing to walk by faith into the unknown. One of my favorite scriptures, and I've shared it with you a few times, is Isaiah 42.16. Isaiah 42.16 says this, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. You know, I think about our, our colonists, our early settlers. I, I'm reading a book right now, and it has various excerpts of journals and, and letters and, and ideas, documents from this time where our country was being formed. And it's amazing the amount of faith that went forth, biblical faith, how people stood on the word of God, trusting that at their moment they couldn't see what the end was, but they definitely knew what the consequences might be. If we walk through this door, if we make this declaration, we know this is an all-in idea that we could lose everything. But if we don't do this, we deny what we believe God has brought us to. And seeing this come alive in their journals and in their excerpts, I think of this scripture, I'll lead the blind by ways they have not known along unfamiliar paths, I'll guide them. And I'll turn the darkness into light before them, and I'll make those rough places smooth. These are the things I'll do. I'll not forsake them. You know, it promises he'll guide us. It promises he'll shed light where it's dark. He'll make it easy walking. He'll do these things, and he won't forsake us. I want to take you to a time with the children of Israel where... They looked at what they felt God had given them, what he had promised them, and it had been completely stripped away. They, we enter a time in their lives, in their journey, where they have been put in exile, into slavery. The, the best of the best of them had been stripped out from the different areas and taken to Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar. We call it the Babylonian exile period. And the children of Israel have been uprooted, and there's different ones during this time frame that will be familiar biblical characters to many of you. One of those is Daniel. Daniel was a prophet. Daniel was one of the best of the best, and there's, there's stories of where he has great faith. One story in particular is one where he, he refused to bow down. He refused not to be ashamed of his God. He opened the doors and he prayed and it was reported. And whoever did this, whoever didn't bow down to the authorities at hand would be thrown into the lion's den. And Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and the, ma the mouth of the lions were closed. And it's an amazing story. Look it up. Read it if you don't know about it. Three other characters that will be familiar to you that are come out of this time frame that we're going to talk about this morning are the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Big names, you know, common American names, right? We know them for their story that King Nebuchadnezzar had, had raised up this huge idol. And everybody at the sound that was given were to bow down to it. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, friends of Daniel, refused to bow down. And with that, if you didn't bow down, you would be thrown into a furnace. And they were thrown into the furnace. And we understand the miracle of that story, where God shows up that not only were they not burned, but the, the bonds that held them burned away. They took them out of the furnace, and God was declared Lord by the king. Amazing stories in this time period, but there's one character that often gets overlooked that was a contemporary of Daniel, and his name's Ezekiel. Ezekiel has his own book. He wrote a book in the Bible. He's a prophet. He's a Levite. He comes from the tribe of Levi out of the children of Israel, which is the priesthood tribe, priestly tribe. At about, scholars believe at about 25 years of age, Ezekiel was taken into captivity into this exile time period. And they believe that at about 30 years of age, he wrote the book of Ezekiel. At about 30, priests come into their own. It's at that time that they are ordained as a priest. And, and he's, a, he's a prophet and he begins to write. And this is the time period in Israel that we're going to pick up on today. Because it was a time period of, God, we know what you've said. 
Let me put it in perspective. We know what door you've shown us with the promised land and how you want to put somebody on the throne and how you want forever and you want to be glorified through this people, the children of Israel. You want, you want all this, but God, we're in slavery. We're in bondage. Everything's cloudy. God, where, where's the door? And that's the time period that we're coming into. Look at Ezekiel 37, 1 through 4. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 4, the hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel saying this. And he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. It's believed this is figuratively, it's, 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 a, it's a vision, it's a prophecy that, that the spirit of the Lord is giving to Ezekiel. Verse 2, and he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Interesting. God brings him to a point. He shows him something. Some of you experienced this. God brings you to a point in your life, he shows you something, maybe a need for change, a situation, an idea. He's done this with Ezekiel against the backdrop of what has happened to the children of Israel. What's God going to do with all these promises? How are these going to be kept? How is this going to play out? And he's shown him this situation. Here's this valley of dry bones. I mean, that would be a scary place, a valley of death. And God looks to Ezekiel, and he says, can these bones live? Oh, sovereign Lord, only you know. You know, our response when we get up to the door, God may ask us a question. Are you going to follow me? What do you think is going to happen? I mean, ultimately, our reply is, God, only you know. And this was Ezekiel's reply, and it, and it tells me that God is perfectly willing and perfectly capable to bring us up to a door. Because he's on the throne. At the end of the day, he's in control. At the end of the day, he knows best. And the question wasn't so God could hear what Ezekiel had to say or had to think so that God would know what to do. God knew what to do. He just wanted Ezekiel to know the situation. And Ezekiel puts it back to God. Only you know, O sovereign Lord. Some things you and I will experience in life we're not going to understand. And it's that hard part we're possibly not supposed to understand. When people go through times of transition, some of you have done that. Some of you are doing that now. Transition, change, even hurt, God uses to build a trust in him. To place our eyes on him and not man. And it's in these times he builds and even rebuilds our lives into something productive for his purposes. And this is where grace and mercy comes into play. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. 9 and 10, he says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God's saying his power is made perfect in weakness. That's tough. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly, the Apostle Paul says, of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In the face of an open door that God has led you to, to be able to say, God, I'm thankful. I'm content. Lord, I don't know what may be on the other side. I have some ideas, but only you truly know. But God, if I trust you, you've never let me down. You've never forsaken me. I mean, whatever God is presenting before you, you can look to him and go, okay, God, you've got this. You've led me to this point. You're not going to drop me here. So whatever happens on that other, other side, if it looks like insults, if it looks like hardship, if it looks like persecutions, calamities, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And that's a hard message for us to take in. And it requires faith because he'll get us through it. Whatever comes our way. Some of you here this morning, you feel like giving up. You feel like what you've gone through 
It's too much sometimes. Don't, don't give up. Don't give up. He will always give you the energy, the motivation to do his will. He'll never lead you up to the open door and then go, now you're on your own. I got you to the door. Uh -uh, that's not our God. He'll always provide you with the ability to give you the heart, the compassion to complete the impossible. You see, God gives the ability to go through the door. He gives the ability. He gives the ability to go through the door. Some people will step up and they go, God, I can't do this. That's saying, God, you can't get me through this. God doesn't get us up to the door to show that he's not able. He gets us up to the door to go, I will give you the ability to get through this. Look at the story, Ezekiel 37, 4 through 6. Ezekiel 37, 4 through 6. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will, I will lay sinews upon you. What are sinews? Sinews are tendons. You know, you can have all the muscles, you can have all the, the, the might in the world, but without tendons, it's worthless. It doesn't work. They make everything work. Makes everything work together. If you've ever injured a tendon, tendon injury is worse than a bone break. It's more painful. I've broke my left ankle twi uh, twice. I've had multiple tendon injuries because I was a basketball player. Twist my ankle, running, doing things I was supposed to be doing and probably things I wasn't supposed to be doing. And you get injured. And I remember a tendon injury. Oh, it's so painful. You can't do anything. You can't move your foot. Can't, you don't want to move your foot. It's interesting that in this prophecy, these dry bones, the representation of what God is going to do with his children, with his people, he's going to bring sinew. He's going to, he's going to breathe into them, but he's going to bring sinew into the situation, how precise it was to the prophet. I'm going to give you the ability allows the muscles to work together. He will not bring anything on you that through him, you and him together can't handle. And secondly, God gives you the heart or compassion to go through the door. You ever, you ever step up and you go, I know I have the ability to do this. I just don't want to do this. Is that only me? I have the ability. I know, God, that you've, you've brought me to this point. You've enabled me, you've given me the ability, but I don't want to do it. You ever do that? Yeah, it's just me, right? Uh-huh. Parents, your kids do this all the time. What were you thinking? You ever said that? Some of you, your parents are still saying that to you. What were you thinking? You, you have the ability to do this, why didn't you do it? Bottom line, didn't want to. You know, when God brings us up to the door, he gives us all the ability. But he gives us this, this motive, this compassion, this heart to go through the door. I got to feel it. You know, we'll step through things that I feel. Look at the scripture. Ezekiel 37, 4 and 6, he says, Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones, say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you. And you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin. I mean, skin's an interesting thing. Skin, we, we have skin, it keeps us in a, in a temperature-controlled state. That's what our skin does for us. It controls our temperature. Skin, it holds the nerves. We have feeling because of skin. All the things we feel is made possible first through our skin. I'll attach tendons to you and cover you with skin. The Lord's saying that I won't just give you the ability to do my will, but also give you the heart and the compassion to do it. There's a lot of people, they'll say, well, I have compassion. I saw that and I felt sorry for them. Compassion's not feeling sorry for somebody. Compassion is doing something about it. This is tough for us sometimes. I want to explain to you what good intentions are without action. People will say, well, I saw this and I really felt bad about it, but I wanted to do something. I meant to do something. I was going to do this. I meant to do this. Good intentions without action. It's a big, long definition. You know what it means? Nothing. 
Well, it's a complicated definition, isn't it? Nothing. Good intentions without action means nothing. Thirdly, God gives you the energy and motivation to go through the door. You understand God can motivate us? He's a good motivator. Again, if you're a parent, you know how to motivate. You want a spanking? That's a motivator. You want a timeout? It's a motivator. We know how to motivate. God knows how to motivate his kids. I want you to go through this door. I've prepared you for it. I've destined you for it. I've given you the ability. I've given you the heart. You've seen it. You know what needs to be done. Do you not think God has the ability to motivate? He motivates us. Ability, feelings, compassion, motivate. They had all they needed, but they didn't have the breath. They didn't have the breath. There was no life. Here's the body. Here's the, the muscles have been connected. The sinew, it's workable. The compassion, the feeling, it's all there. The scripture says they did not have breath. Breath had not come into them. Ezekiel 37, 9 through 10, or 7 through 8 says, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound. And behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. They've stepped up, they stepped up to the, the door, and there's this rattling taking place, this bone. You know, sometimes what God's going to bring us to is something we've never seen before. It's something we've never experienced before. It can kind of freak us out. He already brought, he, he already brought the prophet to a valley of dry bones, a valley of death, hopelessness. And he begins to show him how he's going to rebuild it, and all of a sudden... He's getting up to this threshold, and this rattling is taking place. He's hearing it. What's going on? And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, and there was no breath in them. This breath was missing. This breath was gone. There's no life. There's no, there's no hope in this. Ezekiel 37, 9 and 10 says this. It says, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath that says to the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. I want you to get that word. So I prophesied as he commanded me. He comes to the door. He simply did what God told him to do. He didn't question it. He didn't talk about it. He didn't think about it. He simply did what God told him to do, and the breath came into them. And they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Again, this is a prophecy. God is going to fulfill it. God has shown him this. God is, regardless of the situation he was in, what he was seeing with his mind's eye, we're in captivity, we're in exile. How is God ever going to resurrect the children of Israel to be the nation he's called them to be, to have their own place, to, to be consecrated by him, to be a, an example to a world. We're living in bondage. And God's going to go, you know what? I'm going to show you what you are, and I'm going to show you what you will be. So I don't care what your situation is, or how hopeless you may think it is, God can resurrect things when his breath is upon it. When his breath goes in it. When God gives you mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, you come alive. Amen? He gives you motivation to do the impossible. And this is the pattern God does. He uses motivation to get our attention. You know, we were talking about motivation a few minutes ago. I think of different characters in the Bible. Jonah. God motivated him with a whale. God showed him the open door, what he needed to do. Jonah came to a point, actually went the other direction, going to have to swoop him up by a whale, get him where he needs to go. God can motivate you. I think of Moses. Moses needed motivation. God gave him a burning bush. If that wasn't enough during that time, he gave him a rod, a, a, a staff that he would throw down, would become a serpent, showed him this. Still at the burning bush, that wasn't enough. 
It says, Moses, put your hand into your cloak. He puts his hand in his cloak, bring it out, brings it out. It's got leprosy all over it. That's a motivator. Put it back in, goes away. And time and time again, God motivated. Little motivation of the Red Sea for Moses and the children of Israel. God uses that to, hey, I'm going to get you up to this point. Well, God, it looks like this is a closed door. No, it's a wide open door. You just got to walk through it. But God, there's an ocean. Yeah, but I can take care of the ocean. And they trusted him. Noah needed motivation. In his day, there needed to be motivation. What was the motivation? A flood. You need motivation. Allowing to breathe into you. Allowing to breathe into your situation. In closing this morning, when God opens those doors of opportunity in our lives, he equips us for everything we're going to need to walk through it. And the key is that we, is that what he gives you is not just this idea of just to sit in the valley you see yourself in, but to walk through the opportunity and experience him equipping you with everything that is needed, with everything that will be required on the other side. We have excuses, don't we? She said this, he said this, I thought this, I think it should be like this, I think I'll wait, I think I'll hold for now, I just don't know. I don't feel it. I don't want to. He's made available to us what we need. I want to take you back to that scripture, Ezekiel 37, 10. The prophet says, so I prophesied as he commanded me. I obeyed. If you're here this morning and you're facing something that you need God to show up with. Decision, direction, provision, whatever it is. Healing. Have you done what God has asked you to do. So I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them. Faith went before the manifestation. Faith went before what was needed came about. I did what you commanded and breath entered them and they lived and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. Powerful powerful. I want everyone to stand this morning. I think God is asking us the same question today that he asked Ezekiel. Can these dry bones live? In light of many of the things that are happening in our country, in our world, I think the greatest time for the church is no greater than it is right now. God's light to shine so very bright through his word, through his way. To not just step up through the door, but to blow right through the door, through obedience. To experience that breath into our lives and our situations. And to see a vast army called the church go forth in power to change a world. Can these dry bones live? Only you, sovereign Lord, know. But if we trust him, if we lean into him. Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776. Said, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A descent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Our early colonists, and I'll finish it in a moment, our early colonists had stepped up to a line. Are we going to trust what God has entrusted us with? Are we going to entrust our destiny, our future to our God? Into the foundation that he has placed in our hearts that we have esteemed is right and is principally true upon his word. And they hit that point and they begin to declare their independence. But as you look at the history, declaring their independence was declaring a dependence 
on God. God had to show up. And I believe he did. They said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As we walk through the doors God provides, we have a right to freedom. We have a right to victory. There's a lot of talk in our news and in our nation about rights. Can I tell you, everybody has rights. We have the right to choose God or we have the right to reject God. We have that right endowed by God himself. You have the right to walk up to the door with all the ability and the opportunity to have life breathed into it. And you have the right given by God to deny that fact. And a lot of people do. A lot of people miss what could be in God, through God. We have the right to accept or reject his truth. We have the right to receive his plan of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. We have the right to acknowledge the name of Jesus above every name and authority. And we have the right to live according to the word of God and to establish our foundation for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have that right. Are we going to continue to walk through what God has provided? I think there's no greater time than now for the church in this nation and in this world to be that light. But if we dial it back just a bit, you may be here this morning and you really can't identify with this valley of dry bones. You can identify with with feeling like what God has promised or what you saw with your mind's eye. How is God going to get you to that point? You maybe have had a calling on your life. I believe more than ever, God is going to reestablish callings. What we, what we refer to as callings on people's lives. That he's going to call pastors and missionaries. We, we've talked about this, but teachers business owners, politicians, people who will stand on his word and be used by him. That no matter how difficult this open door is that God leads you to, he gives you the ability and everything because he's going to breathe life into it and you're going to walk to it, through it victoriously. Is it going to be easy? No. Is it going to be worth it? Totally. And for some of you, The life that you've seen, that you wanted, has eluded you for some reason. And it's back here in this this understanding your abilities and understanding the endowment of power that God wants to put on you. And simply trusting Him no matter what. And it's back here, this issue, and you maybe you have glimpses of the door, but for one reason or another, you've fallen short. If you'll just trust Him. If you'll just give Him what you know to give Him. If you'll be faithful with what he's placed in your hands. If you'll do like the prophet Ezekiel. And you'll just simply declare what God told you to declare. You'll do what God told you to do. You'll see a vast army develop in front of you. And I believe that's a call to the church. But I believe that's a call to the body in the church. What are you holding back? And what do you need God to breathe his life into? All you had was the Bible. What is it you're searching for today? I can tell you, he has what's needed to go through the open door, the opportunity. So, has God revealed to you the door you need to go through? Lean into him. Don't miss what he has for you. Don't step up to the threshold and then doubt yourself or get scared. Lean into him and I promise you it'll be worth it. He's got a plan for you. Hey, if we can minister to you and you're in the Sioux Falls area, go to our website, crosswalkcc.com. I promise you, God's got a plan. And maybe this is your church. If we can help, let us know.